Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Dr. Mary O'Connor, co-founder and chief medical officer at Vori Health, a telemedicine company specializing in spinal and orthopedic medical conditions. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm delighted to be with you. Now, tell us a little bit more about Vori Health. What's your 30-second elevator pitch? <laughs> well, as you mentioned, Vori Health is a 100% virtual spine and joint pain medical practice. And we save our patients time and money. And I think more importantly, we save them from inappropriate care and particularly inappropriate surgeries. And how do we do that? We do that by surrounding them with the care team and treating them like a whole person. So our patients get an expert doctor, a physical therapist, a nurse practitioner, a health coach, and a nutritionist. And that team creates a personalized care plan for each patient to help them get better without surgery. And you know what? If they need surgery, we help them find a great surgeon. And that's the kind of health care I would want for my family and myself. Absolutely. And you have partners, partner organizations who are those surgical practice providers who, who you would refer them to at that point, correct? Correct. Yes. And you yourself are an orthopedic surgeon, so you know what you're looking for. That's right. Right. Terrific. So tell us then, what's your favorite part of your job now and why? Well, that's easy. The favorite part of my job is working to make a better health care opportunity and experience for patients because our system is flawed, broken, whatever adjective. Meaning the, the current national care system, not, not Vori Health System is flawed. That's correct. You're the, the solution to the problem. The national health care system is broken. And so I love working on creating a, a better um, opportunity for patients, transforming health care in the musculoskeletal space, which is spine and orthopedic conditions. And so, you know, I get up every day excited about what I'm doing. That makes such a difference, doesn't it? When you're excited to get out of bed because you know you're going to make a difference and you love what you do. Exactly. Now, Mary, what's one of the big issues of the day for you in this world of, of telemedicine? And how do you have to adjust your approach when you're talking to different key stakeholder groups about it? So, Laura, I'll share that what I think is kind of the one of the dirty little secrets in medicine is how much inappropriate surgery occurs. And I'll share with you some data on spine surgery. So several years ago, Walmart started a great program. They looked at their employees that were getting spine surgery, recommended by the doctors in the community. And Walmart is not giving them medical care. They're not employing the doctors, right? They're, they're basically insurance company. Mm -hmm. And so they started a program of sending those employees and paying the expenses of those employees and a companion to go to a designated spine center of excellence where an independent surgeon at that spine center would provide a second opinion to the Walmart employee about whether that surgery was the right surgery for the patient at that time. And 50% of the time, that second opinion of the spine surgeon at the center of excellence was no, you should not have this surgery. Now that is just a staggering finding. And it speaks to how much emphasis there is in the health system for surgeries, advanced imaging like MRI and procedures, because that's fundamentally how health systems make their financial margin. So, so addressing this problem, which is not just expensive, but really harmful to patients, because there is no surgery that doesn't have the risk of a complication. And the spinal surgery in particular is not exactly something that would fall under the elective category. Right. So, so that's what really motivated me to um, leave the comfort and security of my academic orthopedic surgery practice and co-found Vori Health because I, I want to be part of creating the solution. And when you're talking about those kinds of statistics, when you're when you're talking to different groups, when you're talking to either prospective patients or to prospective partners or some, how do you use those stats differently? So that's a really great question. And um, 
I'll talk about two key stakeholders. So we have insurance companies, right? The, the group that's basically paying the bill for the medical care that a patient receives. Sure. And when we go and we talk to an insurance company about what we do, they immediately get it because they understand that there's that there is inappropriate utilization of surgery and MRIs and injections, things like that. And so it's a very easy, basically, pitch to tell the story because they understand the issue and they're looking for solutions. Now, on the other hand, when I go to surgeon groups to be partners with us, I basically share a different, two different messages with them. First, they, they really don't want to hear or talk about how they personally could be part of the problem of a high rate of inappropriate surgeries because I, and I fundamentally don't believe as a surgeon that surgeons are trying to give their patients bad care. But there is a certain amount of bias that comes into the decision making for a surgeon. And, you know, there's the old adage when you have a hammer, all the world is a nail, right? Yeah. So when I talk to surgeons, I shift to two different messages. First, I, I talk to the surgeon group about how we can help their practice become more efficient because we can see those patients that don't need surgery. We can provide great non surgical care, physical therapy, health coaching, nutrition, non surgeon doctors, right? We can support that patient in the care journey that they need, which does not involve surgery. And the surgeons don't really. I think want to do that, nor are they well-trained to do that, in my opinion. The second message to them is that together, we as a virtual company and you as the in-person medical practice, we can go to employers and insurance companies and together be far more competitive to get contracts than either of us alone. Mm -hmm. So I, I do um, edit the messaging, right? Uh, based on the stakeholders. And I think, I think most, most of us do that. Sure. And then that's the challenge is how to do it accurately, right? How to do it tactfully. And in particular, in the situation you just referenced, where you need the, the partner organizations who are those, those surgical service providers, but at the same time, it would be easy to see where they could hear the statistic and immediately get defensive of, you know, are you calling me part of the problem? Are you accusing me of just being money hungry and doing surgeries that aren't necessary for my own pocket? So be, being super careful about how to address uh, that those issues with each organization or with each stakeholder group is, is going to be critical in something like this. Absolutely. Now, Who's the toughest audience you ever had to get through to? Um, I, I would definitely say my surgeon colleagues are the toughest audience in, in my experience. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll share a short story. So I, I was giving a presentation. There was a large group of surgeons. And um, one of the surgeons said in the, you know, the Q&A period, well, you know, I, the surgeon, have the most knowledge and expertise, and I'm the one that can make the correct diagnosis. And patients that see all these other clinicians before me and don't get the right diagnosis are wasting healthcare dollars. And I said, well, that's absolutely true. If that patient is not getting the right diagnosis early, then there will be a waste of healthcare dollars, a delay for the patient. That's all bad. Hmm. We get that. And I fully appreciate that I don't think there's anyone that has more expertise on the surgery side than orthopedic surgeons and spine surgeons for those conditions. And that's certainly something that you can speak to because you are one. Exactly. Sure. And so I, I acknowledge right up front, yes, you have this expertise, you have skills that no one else has. But then I challenge them and say, but I know that every single surgeon in this audience does not see every one of their patients. They will use a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, or if you're in an academic center, a resident to see patients for post-operative rechecks or to see some return patients. So in that scenario, the level of decision-making and expertise is going to be influenced by the clinician who's seeing the patient. So, so you 
have basically acknowledged you've you've acquiesced you've you said yes i am not going to give every one of my patients my highest level of knowledge and expertise because i'm going to have these other people on my team see the patient and that is no um slight to the people on the team because i have worked with excellent um physician assistants and nurse practitioners for my entire career but it's still a different level of knowledge, experience, and training. And you, we know the reason why that they practice that way. It's because of the revenue. It's because of the finances. Sure. And so did you finally get through to him? Well, there was silence after my comment when, when there's no, they all know it's true. I mean, every single surgeon in that audience knew this is true. So if you're going to say my model is flawed because of this, I'm pointing out to you that you essentially embrace that, if you want to call it a flaw or a concern in your practice every day. Got it. Got it. So it's it, this was the uh, not so subtle sledgehammer version of, hey, look, truth is truth. Well, um, surgeons tend to be direct people. Yep. And um, so- when I talk to surgeons, I'm typically a lot more direct than I am maybe with another group. But it sounds like it worked. It did. Now, when the first time that you went from being an individual contributor to leading a team, what's an important lesson that you learned at that time? Um, all right. Uh, this is a bit of a painful personal story, <laughs> but, okay. but I'll, share it. I'll share it. So this was years ago. I was chair of the orthopedic surgery department at Mayo Clinic in Florida, and I had the opportunity to have uh, an executive coach, which I welcomed. And so my executive coach goes around to get some baseline information from my partners. How's Mary performing as your leader, et cetera. So she comes back to me and she distills it down to this sentence, Mary, your partners want you to care for them like you care for your patients. Wow. I was crushed. I was just like, that hit me emotionally. I mean, even now, even me just sharing the story with you, I, I feel those emotions coming back. Because of course, my immediate reaction when you get this kind of feedback is, you know, you get defensive and I'm like, don't they know how much I love them? Don't they know how, how hard I work for them? How I, everything I do is to try and support them and advance them in the department. Like, how can they not know that? And then what I realized is they didn't feel it. And that was just one of my pivotal moments in understanding how I needed to flex my communication style to be a more effective servant leader. And so I started dampening my strong driver mode, you know, drivers are people that just get things done. And it's, you know, the risk is people feel like you're, you know, basically driving over them. And I started to recognize how important it was that I create that space for the emotional connection with not with my partners or other members of the team. So I would purposefully discipline myself at the beginning of a conversation to say, how was your weekend, right? Mm -hmm. How are the children? One of my partners was a huge West Virginia fan. I used to start to watch like what happened with West Virginia sports, because I could tell on Monday, like either West Virginia won or West Virginia lost. And then I was, I, I could just be more prepared. And, and it was, it was those small connecting points that did not take a lot of time that um, helped me be a better leader and were actually enriching for me as well. Yes. And I think a lot of leaders struggle with that sometimes because unfortunately, those kinds of interactions have been uh, all sort of lumped together under a very um, unfortunate label of quote unquote, small talk. And they think, oh, I don't have time for small talk. It's a waste of time. And for me, it, it's it's not that you have to take 20 minutes out of your day to discuss every, you know, Sunday West Virginia football right. play by play necessarily, but it's the it's the effort and the message that the effort conveys, which is that I know this is important to you and you are important to me. And I want to acknowledge that. So I like to call those kinds of moments, the acknowledging the person talk instead of small, 
talk because the person is not small. And those, although the conversation can be short, it, the power is big. The I impact. love that. I love that. That's, that's a, a very accurate description in my mind. So everybody out there, go figure out what West Virginia just did last <laughs> weekend. No, don't, not necessarily, but think, do think about what's important to the people who are important to you and just find a way to acknowledge that. You, it's, am, it's amazing how small gestures like that can go really, really far. So Mary, this brings us to the listener 24 hour influence challenge. This is an opportunity for you to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? Okay, Laura, I'd like to challenge our listeners and, and thank them for, for viewing this and listening to this podcast to ask themselves if they're living in their passion. That's my challenge. Okay. My passion is transforming healthcare to make it better for patients. And so really, you know, I'm living, I'm living my dream right now. And if you're not living in your dream, and not that it's the full-time dream, right? We all have parts of our job that we have to do that aren't, aren't as passion linked, but I would ask you, why not? And what's holding you back? And probably the most important question, because one of my coaches asked me this when I was making the decision about leaving the comfort of academics and going on this big, you know, entrepreneurial journey. And she said, what's your fear? What, what are you afraid of to mm. make this change? And then once I called it out, which was, which I'll share was I'm going to make a lot less money. It's a startup. I'm not going to get paid very much. And, you know, I still have children that I use the term on the payroll. Right. And, and then she said, well, are you going to be able to pay the bills? And I said, yes. She said, well, then you should be able to make it work. And I realized she's absolutely right. I can make it work. And then it became a non-issue and I could make the decision based on where, what do I really want to devote my effort to? So it was really helpful. So I would say, you know, are you living in your, in your passion? If not, what's your biggest fear that's keeping you from doing that? Name the fear, because there's always something that's holding us back. And I would say, not just name it, like think about it, force yourself to either say it out loud or write it down so that you see it. I am afraid of X, because when you see the words on the page or when you otherwise hear them come out of your mouth, you feel yourself saying them, there's going to be a visceral reaction to that, acknowledging a fear. Sometimes you'll think, now that I say it out loud, it sounds really stupid. Or now that I say it out loud, I realize exactly how really powerful that, that how important that issue is that I do have to acknowledge that. And maybe it's something that I do or don't have control over in the moment, but say it out loud or write it down or better yet both write it down and then look at it and read it out loud to yourself, make yourself hear it because something is going to click inside of you. And that's something that can propel you in a lot of amazing different directions from there. So love the challenge for introspection, Mary. Oh, thank you. Now, what about mistakes? Because we've all made them along the lines. What's a communications related mistake that you've made? And if you could have a do-over, what would it sound like? All right. Okay. Here's, here's another story your folks might find interesting. So a few years ago, I had a really difficult colleague. This guy was a bully. A, the people on his team feared him. I mean, I, I, I you know, like, I don't, I don't think that he should have been in the position he was in. But anyway, we had to interact together quite a bit. And one of his physicians on his team basically had a compliance issue that was a serious compliance concern that was brought to my attention. So I reach out to the, my difficult colleague for one whole day trying, I'm texting him, I'm emailing him, I'm calling his secretary. Hey, this is important. I really need to talk to you today about so-and-so. Okay. No response. He does the passive, maybe passive aggressive. I'm not responding to you, Mary. So the next day I'm like, okay, I have to report this to the comp appropriate compliance person because we need to address this. This is a potentially serious issue. 
Meaning he, the original issue that was serious, not his, issue. not his non-response. No, okay. well, that that was the That's issue of issue. his physician. His physician had some a, a, a behavior that was a compliance problem, Got which it. I recognized was brought to my attention. Now I have an obligation to the institution to make sure that the right people hear about it so that we can fix it. Sure. First, I go to his direct report because I want to say, hey, here's what's going on. And I want to make sure you're part of this conversation. But he would not respond to me. So the next day, I said, okay, I have to go to the head of compliance and raise and, and bring this up because now this is the third day, right? I mean, I knew about this two days ago. He then got a call from the compliance person and then called me and was livid. Sure. Screaming at me, doing his best bullying and intimidation communication style. And what I did that was a mistake was I matched his communication style. Mm. And I literally just started letting him have it. I reached out to you. You ghosted me. I did all these things. This was incredibly disrespectful. Your person did this, which is a serious concern. The institution needs to be protected. Like I am not, I am just not taking it from you. Silence on his end. And that was it. That was the end of the conversation. In fact, it was so heated. You'll find this funny. My secretary got up and closed my office door. <laughs> okay. That's how, right. And she was like, she came in afterwards. She says, are you all right? I've never heard you talk like that. So. So why later, was it a mistake that he was silent afterwards? Oh, he just was silent. Like after I just, I sure. bullied him back. I literally just bullied him back. But why is that a mistake? You framed this as your mistake. Why was that here's, a mistake? Here's the reason why it's a mistake. So later that day, that night, I actually had a session with my coach, probably here a theme. I love coaches. I've learned a lot from my coaches. So I happen to just have one scheduled and I go and I'm telling her about this encounter. And she says, and how do you feel about it? Like all good coaches <laughs> ask you how you feel about things. And I said, I actually am not sure I handled that as well as I could have. I didn't like that I basically lost my cool because react, reacting in an emotional state is almost always a mistake. And she said, he's a bully and he's a bully all the time. And you know what, Mary, he has a very strong bully muscle because he flexes it all the time. And you are not a bully. You, do, you have a very, very weak bully muscle. And you will not consistently outbully him. And we need to work on a different style, a different approach for how you deal with an individual like that. And that was very insightful to me because it helped me understand that I need to stay true to my authentic self, right? But what would have been a good alternative if it's a matter of not matching, if, if standing up to the bully with the same energy to show him that he can't intimidate you is not the right approach because that doesn't feel authentic to who you are. If you could go back and have a do-over, what would you have done differently now in hindsight? Well, I would have stayed calm and I would have said, I am not going to have a conversation with you when you're speaking to me this way. And I do think we should talk about it. And as you know, I repeatedly tried to reach out to you. So when you want to have a conversation, we can have a conversation and we're going to include the head of compliance. And that's there it. There that's it, go. right? So I deflect all of his negative energy. I'm like, no, buddy, I'm not going to let that stick to me. Mm -hmm. I am not going to go into your bad zone here, right? Just yep. not. Yes. And yep. that, I would have felt better about that and it would have been more authentic to me. And not get your blood boiling at the same time. Nobody likes the adrenaline rush that you're left with after a screaming match. Exactly. Right, right. So, and I love the the before and the after. So everybody go back and listen to the beginning or if nothing else, listen to that last minute or so about the, the way to not take the bait. Because I think we all do that at some point or other, we take the bait and bait never tastes good and then we're hooked. So that's, it never puts us in a good place. Now, with regard to hard conversations like accountability pieces, that was one with regard to compliance, which may fall under a similar category. What's an approach that you've used to address an accountability issue with somebody on your team? 
So Laura, that's a great question. Fortunately, I, I I'm blessed to have a really great team, but recently one of my very strong team members basically um, lied to me. He was supposed to have submitted some paperwork, emailed me that he had done it, and then I found out that he hadn't. So now that I know that he hasn't done what he said he was going to do, I need to address it. So I set up a call with him. So we Zoom and I say, you know, oh, and here's another thing that I, that I, discipline myself to do whenever I'm going to enter into one of these conversations. I try to get my mindset around all the things that I really like about this person so that I'm trying to go into this encounter, not angry and, and um, projecting more energy of support and that, that I value him. So I go into the conversation and say, listen, you know, we need, we just need to talk about this. And the first thing I want to know is like, are you okay? Are things okay at home? You know, let's do the check-in. Is there something else going on? No, everything's okay. I said, all right, then let's talk about what happened. Because you know, you, you know, you needed to submit it. I, you told me you submitted and you hadn't submitted it. And he said, he basically just came clean and he said, I messed up. I knew I was supposed to have it done. I just sent you that note and I'm I meant to do it and then I got further delayed and it won't happen again. I said, okay, good. There we have it. So it was, it wasn't, you know, those conversations I never find fun, but it wasn't antagonistic. There, there wasn't a, um, I'm going to beat you up, right? There wasn't a winner loser mentality. It was okay. Let's put this out. We need to talk about this because I want to have a great we want to have a great relationship together. And this is clearly something that is challenging our trust and we need to reestablish that trust. And I think that's, it's interesting because there are, the fact that you've had a good long relationship with this person, there was already a foundation of trust and a foundation of trust in the person and in the quality of the work that you knew that he was otherwise able to provide. And so it's interesting that your choice was to, uh, to to recognize that there is a time and a place to hear the person's apology, that they, they acknowledge their mistake, they accepted responsibility, they said it won't happen again, and rather than belabor, that, but but why didn't you get it done? And but why you know did you lie to me? And but why did you just to let it go and say you know what? Okay, and just to leave it at that. Now if it happens again, then different. there's two different issues to to go. But to give that person the second chance and just let it be. And, and that's, I think that's not intuitive for a lot of people. Then, of course, should something like that otherwise happen, there are two separate issues that would have to be addressed. One is why the work didn't get done. Was it about ability? Was it about motivation? Was it about something else? And number two, when approached about it, why did you lie? Because that's a whole different issue. And those, you know, they're overlapping, of course, in some ways, but to be able to address one versus the other is something that uh, we need to be mindful of as well. But I, I love the fact that you were able to recognize in that moment, just acceptance and move on, clean slate, new start, second chance was sufficient. And I take it that since then, it, there has no, not been a repeat. Great. Yeah, he, he, he's a he's a great uh, employee for us, really strong. I mean, this was the one you know, incident. And, and I just needed, to, we needed to clear the air on it. And he, sure. you know, we need, he needed to tell me I messed up, which he did. He didn't make excuses. He said, I should have done it. I didn't do it. This won't happen again. And I'm like, okay, I believe you. I trust that this is moving forward. This is how it'll be. And that's good. Nice. Thank you. Speaking of teams and the organization overall, if somebody in the organization, your current or past, wanted to move up into a senior leadership role, aside from their technical expertise, of course, what's one skill they'd have to demonstrate to you and why? That's a great question. And um, I'll go back to my team theme. Um, they would need to show me that they can lead a team. And when I talk about leading a team, I'm really talking about creating and supporting a climate of psychological safety for the members of that team. Um, because if you don't have that, 
then people are afraid to contribute. They're afraid to speak up and you cannot leverage the power of the diversity on your team. So uh, to me, psychological safety is so critically important. And I would need that, that future leader to demonstrate to me that they have skills to support that. Not that we're any, none of us are perfect, right? But let me see some of, of your ability to do that. To create psychological safety. Yes. That's powerful, powerful. Otherwise, you, you can't have other critical conversations of really any sort, can you? No, you can't. Yes. Amazing. Now, finally, you're establishing your, an entirely new company at this point. So, which also means you're not just creating a new structure, you're creating a new culture. As Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. What's one communication pattern that you've seen either in your current or past uh, environments that has had a huge cultural impact, whether positive or negative on a team that you led or were part of? So that's a great question. And Peter Drucker, absolutely correct. No question about it. Um, we are focused at Vori Health on creating a, a very inclusive culture, uh, one with you know high psychological safety, where all of our employees can be their best selves and bring their best selves to the workplace. Because if we do that, then we're going to be able to provide the best care for patients the best experience, et cetera. So one of the things that I've found to be helpful and powerful is to basically educate the team on different communication styles. And so the framework that, that I learned that I like to use because it's relatively simple and easy to understand is there's four basic styles, the driver that I already mentioned, the analytical who's so strongly data-driven, the expressive who's kind of your visionary big picture person, and the amiable who's very focused on the connections that people have with each other. And um, when we were on our clinical retreat, we basically spent almost most of a whole day doing a workshop on this. So people could really understand People have these communication styles. How does that impact how I interact with someone? You know, if Mary's being in really strong driver mode and I'm an amiable and I'm really concerned about the relationship, am I feeling, you know, I'm not feeling the love and how does that influence how I come into the work with the team? And so helping people understand that, first of all, we need all those four types of people on the team to really be high performance and how we can flex our personal style to more effectively communicate with others. And secondly, how we can give each other more grace when we're stressed and we revert back to a dominant style that maybe doesn't align so well with my style, that let's just have a little bit more understanding of that and give ourselves a little bit more slack. So, I, and, and I have fun with that work and I, and, I, I find it highly powerful and effective at advancing that team to really go from, you know, uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Yes. Yes. That's a, a good reference that you can imagine the J curve. That is a, the common trajectory. So many new teams go through their in the original formation. Then of course the, the culture shock, the challenges, the honeymoon phase is over as it were, that's the storming norming is we get our act together. And then finally the performance of where we're really a successful, cohesive, productive team. So with all of that, Mary, how can people learn more about you and Vori health health? Well, they can go to our website, just Google, you know, it's vorihealth.com, V is in victory, O-R-I health.com. And um, we'd be delighted to help anyone that has any kind of spine or joint condition. Um, you can see us directly, you know, so we do direct, basically direct to consumer, or of course you can have a physician refer you to us. We take a lot of insurance. We also have what I, I would call a very, a very reasonable um, out-of-pocket cost uh, that is inclusive of all of our services on a monthly basis. Um, and so I would just encourage people to check us out. And now, Mary, you are also an author and you have a book coming out soon, don't you? 
Oh, Laura, thank you so much for asking. Yes, I'm very excited. Um, I started this project before uh, Vori Health was, you know, a, a concept. And um, my co-author is a medical anthropologist I met at Yale. And our book is coming out in bookstores in early October. And it's called Taking Care of You, The Empowered Woman's Guide to Better Health. And this book is a book for the everyday woman. To, to give her information that will empower her to be a better advocate for her own health. We have a hundred women contributors who wrote various chapters on medical conditions, on accessing healthcare, on wellness issues. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that it will help women because unfortunately, women, women don't get the same health care as men, and in particularly women of color don't get the same health care as men. And uh, I'm very passionate about health equity. I chair a national nonprofit called Movement is Life. And so this book was just kind of a natural evolution of that passion of mine and my years of experience of seeing women coming to me as patients who did not have good experiences with other orthopedic surgeons, and I'll translate that into predominantly white male orthopedic surgeons, mm. um, and not getting good care. And I'm like, wow, we just we just need this is not okay. So, I, so this I, book I, answers those challenges. Yes, and I'm I'm really hopeful that it will be um, a great resource uh, for women. Um, we're fortunate to have Mayo Clinic Press as our publisher, and um, early October bookstores. Fun. Fantastic. And I'm sure online as well, Amazon and, and the like. So thank please you, remember yes. to check that book out. Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Laura. I hope this was, um, I really enjoyed it. And I hope that uh, my comments and stories are helpful uh, to listeners. No doubt. No doubt. It's resonated with an awful lot of people out there. And to everybody else, thank you for tuning in as always. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or your favorite podcast platform so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.